Friday to be here um, to join us for this. I'm really excited. Today is my first day in Pennsylvania ever. Um, I'm from Canada. Um, it's cold. Uh, Tim Hortons is great. We love hockey. Um, so I just confirmed everything you ever wanted to know about Canada, I guess. Um, and uh, I'm really uh, enjoying my time here. I really appreciate the uh, organizers um, and the team that puts these events together for inviting me. Um, Brother Minhaj um, and Sheikh Muhammad Ashinavi, who couldn't be here today, but um, and, and the rest of the team as well. And also I came here and will be going back, inshallah, with an amazing group of friends. Um, so I really appreciate them as well. So uh, please keep uh, them and all of us and all of the organizers in your duas. Jazakallah khair. So um, a few disclaimers before we begin this presentation. It's not a very long presentation, or it might be, I don't know. I can't make any promises, to be honest. Um, it's not very complicated that I can promise you. Um, this is a series I'm sure many of you have been attending on Islam around the world, Islam in different regions. And the purpose is to really break the ice, right? Because it's amazing how much in each region of the world, how much Islamic history, Islamic heritage, how many Muslim experiences there are in each region of the world. I mean, literally, you could start and do a lecture on the history of Islam in Antarctica, and it would, there would be a lot of things to discuss, right? Um, and so when we have these kinds of lectures, I know there are things that you may have read, you may have heard um, about the region that we're covering, about the history of Islam there. The reason I give this disclaimer at the beginning is so expectations are not particularly high and there are no disappointments inshallah because my purpose here is to just break the ice with you, give you some key names, some key dates, some key concepts to keep in mind, hopefully inspire you to go and learn on your own and if you know, you'd know you like to learn more and you want to have book recommendations and things of that sort, please uh, you can come up to me afterwards and I'd be happy to share those with you and perhaps uh, share them with the masjid as well and it can pass it on to each of you. So please keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is um, my language skills with reference to the region that I'm going to be talking about are not particularly strong, which is really to say that they're basically non-existent. Um, so I may mispronounce names and uh, I do apologize for that. It may not be very accurate, but hopefully most of the key names we'll be discussing, you can see uh, the English transliteration on the screen in the presentation and so you can um, you know, confirm on your own afterwards as well. And uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end, inshallah. Are we good? Jazakallah khair. So let's begin. Um, a few things to discuss right off the bat, right? Um, usually when there are strong Muslim communities in different regions of the world, um, they have their own particular cultural history, and that cultural history is something they want to trace back to the time of the Prophet So in some way, they want to say that, oh, our community, uh, our, the presence of Islam among our people goes back all the way to the time of the Prophet And the Muslims in the East Asian context are no different. And we'll talk about what we mean by East Asia in a second, but when we talk about that region as a whole, there's some things that we can get out of the way. Um, the first thing you may have heard is this uh, hadith, uh, purported hadith narration that the Prophet ﷺ is alleged to have said, seek knowledge even if you have to go as far as China. Um, and the reality of that narration is that it's not authenticated in the sense that it's not particularly strong and we should be very careful about attributing words to the Prophet ﷺ that um, for all we know, based on all of the rigorous methodology we have in the field of hadith, he probably never said that, right? So first of all, we should keep that in mind. Of course, the general rule um, that it is the obligation of every Muslim to seek knowledge applies. And of course, an implication of that is to do whatever you have to do, seek knowledge by whatever means necessary um, and go out there and learn. And part of that is cultural learning about different parts of the world. The other uh, connection to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which you may have heard, 
um, and this is particularly strong among the Chinese Muslims. And we'll talk about what we mean when we say Chinese Muslims because there are many different Muslim groups who exist within the present day borders of the People's Republic of China um, who, and some of them do identify themselves as ethnically Chinese Muslims and many of them do not. So we will have that conversation in a bit as well. Um, but in general, uh, the Hui Muslims in particular, um, they say that uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, who was of course a Sahabi radiallahu anhu, he was an uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of their relationship, but he was actually younger than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and one of the earliest to embrace Islam in Mecca. Um, there is a story in the cultural history of the Hui Muslims and other Muslims as well in China that um, one of the Chinese emperors of the Tang Dynasty, uh, and he was alive around the same time as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, basically had a dream in which he saw a person wearing a turban and robes, and that person was somehow essential to the safety of his kingdom. So when he woke up, he uh, asked the people in his court about the different parts of the world, the way people dress there, and when he described what he had seen in his dream, um, it was told to him that there are these people to the west, of course, to the west of China, and they are Muslims, and they tend to dress this way. And with that, he um, sent a uh, embassy to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is while the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is still alive. And um, it's said that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas uh, who was dispatched as an envoy, as a messenger uh, to take sort of a diplomatic message from Arabia, from the Khulafa al-Rashidun to the people of China, but there is very, very little actual evidence for this. It's not really corroborated um, by any sources, and even the sources that we have in terms of um, the sources that Muslims themselves have produced about our records of history, there's really no mention of this and it's part of the cultural memory, which is not to say that it's not important and I don't want anyone to kind of go and start arguing with someone who believes in this history. Of course, we do try to correct in the most reasonable way possible to make sure we all have the right understanding of our history, but it's, it's not really a point that should be causing any kinds of strong arguments. It's just part of the cultural memory of a people and Muslims all over the world and all cultures have these kinds of stories, again, going back to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what is the first encounter of the early Muslims with these people um, in East Asia? Uh, there's two different uh, routes through which this encounter occurs. The first one is trade, um, and trade uh, predated the arrival of Islam on the scene. So the Arabs, the Persians, uh, they would go all the way to um, China for trade, and we will see maps and we will talk about trade, inshallah. The other uh, route, the way people get to know each other, of course, is war, <laughs> right? Um, and we'll show you a map in a second of the Battle of Talas. Uh, Talas is a place that is now, or sometimes uh, pronounced in some uh, transliteration is pronounced Taraz in Kazakhstan, um, and you'll see it on a map, but basically as the Muslim Empire was expanding eastward into Central Asia, and the Chinese um, had a what's called the long arm of the Tang Dynasty, which also extended westward from China into Central Asia, it was only going to be a matter of time, uh, you know, before these two massive empires would collide into each other, and this is what happened at the Battle of Taraz. And it's a very, um, it's almost like a battle that you never hear about. Um, it was kind of in the far corners for both empires. It wasn't somewhere right in the middle, um, which is why it you know, doesn't get a lot of attention, but it was very significant in the kind of boundaries it established about what was going to be the Persian Muslim sphere of influence, especially in Central Asia and on the other uh, side what China uh, would claim historically as its own sphere of influence in Central Asia. So this battle occurs, the Abbasid dynasty, right, the Abbasiyun, they win the battle. So the Muslim armies are victorious in the battle. They bring back some prisoners of war, um, and there's one prisoner of war in particular, his name is uh, Dahuan, 
who was imprisoned in Kufa in Iraq uh, for 10 years between the year 751 and 761. He spends in the year uh, in the city of Kufa. This is before Baghdad was built, so Kufa was still the capital uh, of the Abbasids. And he leaves these very interesting outsider descriptions of an early Muslim society. It's very interesting to read how he describes um, how the men and women dress, what they do, who they pray to, what kind of uh, khutbas does the, the Khalifa give. Like this is in the days when the Khalifa himself would still go on the mimbar and give the khutbah himself. So, you know, there's all of these interesting details. You can read an article about it if you um, Google a Chinese prisoner's description of Islam. You will easily find the article and you can read all of the details there. I won't go into them, but it's just a fascinating picture of, you know, how others see you before instead of just how you see yourself when it comes to early uh, Islamic history. Um, and then, uh, did this just get louder? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, as long as you guys are okay, it's good. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I mentioned the Silk Road trade route and two routes in particular, uh, which are the overland and the maritime uh, route. And both of them, of course, because of the virtue of geography where the Muslim empire had expanded its control to, um, there was inevitably going to be a uh, exchange of people, of goods, um, of ideas between these two prominent civilizations. And by the way, what's called in Europe, right, is the Dark Ages. When we learn history in the West, like in the schools here, it's called the Dark Ages, right? Or at most, they'll call it the Middle Ages because there was a decline in cultural uh, productivity in Europe, right? But in other parts of the world, in Africa, right, in the Middle East, in East Asia, culture was still flourishing. So when we get a more global view of history, we can appreciate more um, how humans uh, and people in different civilizations have continued to move forward uh, in all aspects of life while Europe was in a period of decline. Um, next slide, please. All right, so uh, let's look at a map for a second. I hope that's kind of clear for you guys. I'm gonna get up and try to point some things out here. So what you see here is uh, Central Asia, not a particularly familiar part of the world. It doesn't have any special shapes or something. Many people just call it, you know, the Stan countries. All the Stans are in Central Asia. Um, so what are you seeing here? You're seeing the uh, Umayyad Khilafa, right? Um, the Umayyad Empire, if you will. You can see the city of Rey, which is today called Tehran. It's the capital of Iran. So you can see the Iranian sphere will always, uh, the sphere of influence, which is marked sort of by all of these um, maroon lines, will always be significant in relations, Muslim relations with the Chinese, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, you can see some other familiar names maybe, right? So, but there's Kabul, uh, the capital of Afghanistan, right? Herat, very important city. And the Silk Road is basically coming uh, through this entire area. So what we know as the Overland Silk Road. So you have these two kind of, you know, if you imagine like a metro or a subway or something, you have these two kind of terminuses, these two main stations. You start um, in the cities of China, which we'll see in another map in a second. And then you come down into the cities that are thriving in the Middle East under Muslim rule. Um, these little arrows all mark campaigns. So these are military campaigns as the Muslims are expanding into Central Asia. So you can see some cities there, actually, um, it's probably not very clear for you guys, but you know, there's Samarkand over there. Um, some of the cities that we still know today that we know are part of our heritage, there's Bukhara over there where Imam Bukhari was born. Um, and then you see here is the Tibetan Empire. So Tibet is, I'm sure you guys have heard the name before, uh, Tibet is another part of Inner Asia, so this is Inner Asia rather than Outer Asia, it's the center of the map, that's occupied by the People's Republic of China today. Um, and what you see coming in here is what I just mentioned, the long arm of the Tang Dynasty. So this is a Chinese empire it has its bases in the east along the Pacific Ocean, where we usually think of when we think of China, but it has this long arm reaching into Central Asia, mostly so they can control trade routes, right? If you can control the trade routes, you can collect the taxes and you can get rich, 
This is basically you know, a, the, one of the key equations that plays out throughout history in Central Asia. Who's going to control this route? Who's gonna collect the taxes? Who's gonna make the money, right? Um, and another thing that you'll notice there is right up there at the top, it says uh, Uyghur uh, Khanate, right? It says Khaganate, but it's, it's really pronounced Khanate. So the Uyghurs are a Turkic people. And we'll talk about this in more detail as well. Um, the Uyghur Muslims, as we say today, they are a Turkic people, which means they're not, they're not Turkish. When you say Turkish, it implies the country of Turkey. When you say Turkic, uh, it implies an ethno-linguistic uh, group. So they have some common shared ethnicity and they have some common shared language roots. Um, and they're also related to the Mongols. So where you see the Uyghur Khanate from the year 744, you have this new state, a Uyghur country, where today it's Mongolia, but that's where their state was. Over time, the Uyghurs are going to migrate south to this area. So this is what we call today Turkestan or uh, Uyghurstan, right? Um, some of the key cities there are like, you know, Yarkand, Hotan, uh, you have Kashgar, and you have, um, you know, some of the other ones. And so the important thing to then keep in mind is some of the key players in this region, right? So you'll always have some kind of Muslim empire that loosely controls Central Asia. There's a lot of local rule in Central Asia, which means there are a lot of people who can play the chess, right? There's a lot of pieces moving around. You will always have Tibet, which will often work um, with the Uyghur people who are to the north the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, and Tibet will have its own Islamic history. Tibet is the historic home of the, the Dalai Lamas, right, of the, the Buddhist uh, religion. Um, and you will always have a Chinese long arm trying to reach into inner Asia to control in the past that used to be trade routes. In present day, it's trade routes, but even more importantly, it's natural resources. Right, which wasn't really a concern back in the day, but now it is. So this is sort of a map of like the territory uh, that we are trying to cover. Next slide, please. And this is like a, a bigger picture, right? So you have uh, the map of the routes of two travelers. So you have Jiadan and uh, Ibn Khurradibi, something like that. I apologize, even the Persian is too much for me. Um, so you have a map around the year 800. You have China and the Islamic world, right? So we just saw a close-up of that specific region, what's happening there. There's your Samarkand, again, your Kashgar, right, where the uh, Uyghur people, you see the Uyghur people are still in the north in what is today Mongolia, and they're going to migrate south to that region, and they're going to settle there. That's going to become their home. Um, you can see, of course, the Middle East region, the Abbasid Khilafa has come into power, or the Abbasid Empire. Um, and these are the major trade routes. So the Muslim merchants are very, very quickly going to move and establish, you know, here's your, um, this is what Karachi used to be called, by the way. You have your Daibul, you have your Kilon, you have Gujarat over there, Sri Lanka going into Indomalaya, and then the terminus, right? Think of these as the, like your subway trains. So they're the terminal station right, where you go for trade. And these cities in particular, um, right, you have Guangzhou, you have Quanzhou, um, these two in particular. And for the overland route, the main uh, terminus for the Muslims who are coming in tr as traders is uh, Xi'an, or what used to be called Chang'an, uh, in upper China over there, right? So um, another uh, few things to notice is Japan is here, it's in the picture, but it's a bit off the main trade route, right? It's not right on there. So this, this is where most of the trade is ending up. Most of the travelers are ending up. Most of the da'is, people who follow merchants, mostly the people who are going to give da'wah, the scholars, the traveling Sufis, uh, this is the region where they are ending up. And another region where they're going to surprisingly end up is in Sila, which is uh, Korea. Right, so we'll talk about Korea in a second as well. But hopefully this gives you a picture of the main uh, routes, right? So you have the city route at the top and then you have the sea route um, going through here through which Islam is going to spread in China um, and Muslim uh, Chinese relations and relations with other sort of East Asian nations are going to develop. Another thing to keep in mind is um, 
the geography, like the physical geography, right? Um, so one of the things that defines modern China as we know it are just the physical geography. So, you know, this first half, I'm tall, but not tall enough, like up until maybe from like here to like around here is what you can call China proper. And in fact, historically, it's been called China proper. That is China. And the rest, as I said, is Turkestan, where you see like Kashgar and those cities, and south of that is Tibet. So anything to the west of here is basically, you could argue, occupied territory, which is not historically, culturally Chinese. The Tibetans have their own distinct culture, and the Uyghur Muslims have their own distinct Turkic culture, and they look westward. They have their own particular outlook, right? And so much uh, violence that we see is enabled by modern day borders that were created with no concern for what people actually, you know, what sort of um, cultural families they identified as. Like the same problem with the Uyghurs, uh, sorry, uh, with the Rohingya, just as a side note, the Rohingya Muslims all live around here, like right along the coast. This is Arakan, right? This is India, which was of course under Muslim rule. This is Bengal, which has a huge Muslim population, but there's a mountain range here. So this is all Burma, but the Rohingya are separated from the rest of the Burmese by these mountains for centuries and centuries, which means what? They're gonna have their own distinct culture. They're gonna have their own language. They're gonna look westward for their relationships. So their relationships are closer to the Muslims of Bengal, but of course, when the British create Burma, the modern uh, borders of Burma, they just kind of mash people together based on their own interests. And we see this again and again in different parts of the Muslim lands. And the same thing is true for China as well. China, main body, arm reaching out there. Muslims, main body over here, arm reaching out across Central Asia. And of course, like I said, there are a lot of local uh, players involved as well. Next slide, please. All right, so I said I would keep it short. Did I say that? All right, I'll try to speed it up. <laughs> um, Four main, you know, again, just to keep, give you some key concepts. Within Chinese Islam, so remember what I just suggested is China proper. There are multiple Muslim minorities in China, minority groups, right? So China has, the People's Republic of China today has 55 official uh, groups identified as minorities. Um, 10 of them are Muslim majority. Right, and the Hui being more prominent, there's over 20 million of them in 2010, Hui Muslims in China, and that's just one of the Muslim groups in China, and that was in 2010, so it's probably significantly higher now. Um, trade, especially, like I mentioned, in Xi'an, in Guangzhou, in Quanzhou, which was known to the Arabs as Zaytun, um, is flourishing for most of the Middle Ages, right? You can read about Ibn Battuta's travels there. So Ibn Battuta travels all the way from Morocco. And something interesting that happens when Ibn Battuta goes to China is he actually meets someone there who he knew from Morocco. So he's not even like the only guy who is crazy enough to like go all across the world and end up on the other side of the world, but he actually meets a guy from like back home, right? Like, you know, what are you doing here too? Um, but Zaytun becoming one of the official names of this port shows the significance that the Arab and Persian traders, and to some extent, the Indians and Sri Lankans as well, the effect and the impact they were having on this uh, important Chinese port city, right? To the point that it was even among the Chinese, it was uh, called like variations of the word Zaytun. The reason they did that is because there was a tree there that looked like the olive tree, and Zaytun, of course, right, uh, refers to olives. So they named the city after that. Um, and there's thousands and thousands of Muslims living there, the oldest mosques in China, all of which go back to about 1300 years old, of course they've been rebuilt over time, are all in these three cities. So Xi'an in the north, which was the mainland route, right, uh, Guangzhou and Quanzhou, and again, the same uh, routine. The merchants come first, trade is an important uh, vehicle to you know, move around your da'wah, to move around your way of life. Merchants come first, the scholars follow, the diplomats follow, the Sufi uh, traveling Sufis, they follow, and slowly communities start to form, they intermarry with the locals, and you have a homegrown, over time, a homegrown Chinese Muslim community. Um, 
Pax Mongolica. So this is uh, during the Tang Dynasty. This is during the early dynasties, let's say from around the year 750 to maybe around the 1200s, early 1200s. Then you have what's called the Pax Mongolica, right? So these are the Mongols, uh, which I'm sure we've all heard about. Um, the Mongol conquests were horrific. Um, I won't go into the details because that's not the topic here. Um, they were horrific for the Muslims. They were also horrific for the Chinese, and they created this truly like world empire, absolutely enormous empire. Um, and I don't mean to like you know whitewash that and the the hor you know the horrible legacy of that. But one of the things it did do is it opened up trade and it opened up connections like no other because now you have one empire in charge of all of these different places, and so they are moving people around. And they're also moving people around because the Mongols were very small in number, right? They didn't have many of their own numbers. They were small in number, so they needed people to, I mean, you can conquer, but running a country is more complicated. You can conquer with your sword, but then how are you gonna run it? You have to bring in administrators, and you have to bring in people from other places and implant them because you can't trust the locals, because you just conquered them and maybe killed their family, so why, why would they you know, work for you? Uh, in a way that would be faithful. So they're moving people around, um, and in particular, they would call uh, the Muslims, the Mongols will refer to the Muslims as the Simu, which means they have colored eyes for some reason, I'm not sure why, um, but they would refer to them as colored eyed people, and especially a lot of Persian Muslims, the Yuan dynasty, which was the Mongol dynasty occupying China for several centuries, they will bring in uh, these mostly Persian Central Asians um, and settle them in what is China, and then they themselves, of course, will become part of the mix as these Muslim communities uh, grow within China. Um, and it's, it's very interesting to read about that period, uh, just because how familiar it can be for those of us who are from other parts of the Muslim lands, like, you know, Persian was one of the official languages of the Chinese court, the Mongol court at the time, and we'll see uh, another example as well uh, shortly. Then we move forward, so this is the Yuan Dynasty in the Middle Ages. We take another huge jump forward. Communities, like I said, are developing in the background, but you have, the, a, you have a community, and then that community uh, starts to produce local Islamic culture, right? So communicating Islam in local language in a way that is um, you know, easily understood, the kind of references, the kind of descriptions that you use, um, it's easily understood by the local people who you are giving da'wah to. So this is now truly Chinese Islam giving da'wah to uh, Chinese non-Muslims, right? Um, and there's a collection of uh, books that are written that become collectively known as the Han Kitab, right? So this is a collection of books about Islam. Uh, often, you know, Confucius and Confucianism is this uh, ancient uh, philosophy and, uh, you know, sort of guiding um, set of principles in Chinese history and combining that and some Buddhist influences as well with the uh, Islamic tradition in very interesting ways. Um, and this becomes really, uh, it's led by the Hui culture, right? And it's hard to define at this stage and even today to be honest, who the Hui are. So Hui usually refers to Muslims, something having to do with Islam, but there's differences about is it an ethno-linguistic group is it just all Muslims in China, which we know isn't the case? So this is sort of an ongoing debate. But just to give you an example, I do want to um, quickly, you know, one of the uh, Chinese scholars from this period, so now we're talking about the 1600s, the 1700s, um, I want to read his, his description of Islam. So he was asked a question um, to describe Islam. Oh, great, I lost the answer. One second. Sorry. Break time, guys. Um, he was asked a question about describing Islam and what he said in response was very interesting. Uh, so here we go. He says, um, Islam's highest principle holds that human beings are sojourning merchants, that the material world is the marketplace, that human nature and the heavenly decree are the capital that exchanges with friends are the transactions, that personal intentions are the measuring scale, that good and evil are the goods for sale, that death is returning home 
that God's rewards in heaven are the riches and God's punishment in hell is poverty. The sojourning merchant always returns home and the goods on loan in the end return to their original master. Whatever business you may be in, it comes and then it goes flying by in no time at all. So this is his description of Islam, right? And, but it's not something that we would typically hear in other parts of the world, or this isn't the kind of description that you hear in your local khutbah, right, the day before. And the reason for that is he's using this very particular kind of business-oriented language to explain to another person who asks the question what Islam is, right? And so there's these kind of, um, you know, cultural uh, manifestations of Islam in the region that you can find many of them of. You know, you can find it in the architecture style. Um, you can find it in things like the prevalence of women's only mosques in China. China has one of the highest ratios of women's only mosques and a very, very strong tradition of uh, female, uh, you know, Islamic scholarship of you know teachers and then their students and then the students become teachers and then they become students, etc. So all of these things are sort of very particular um, to the Chinese Muslim experience. Next slide, please. I know I did say uh, the Muslim rebellions on that slide. Um, so Muslims did rebel at times against Chinese rule. Against this is uh, the, you know there's a um, constant flux. Right? When we think about countries today, we often think about like very fixed borders and armies and there's literally nothing you can do to uh, get around that. But in the past, a lot of things were in flux and um, the only state, the Muslim state, there was a Muslim sultanate that existed in China proper uh, in the 1700s for about 20 years. So this was the only time in history that there was a Chinese Muslim state which came about as a result of the Panthe Rebellion as it's called. It was brutally crushed, you know, the war was ongoing and many of those Muslims after they, they lost that war, after they lost their state, they actually fled to Burma um, and, and established some of the uh, Burmese Muslim communities um, and some of them, you know, went to Thailand and established the, the famous uh, Cham Muslims, the indigenous Cham Muslims of China. So there's a lot of movement happening and there's a lot of Muslim communities in flux, right? But here are some of the, the manifestations of Chinese Islam that I was just mentioning. Um, this is the mosque in Xi'an, which is one of the oldest mosques um, uh, in China. So this is about 1300 years old. Of course, not this structure. It's been rebuilt over time. Uh, but because the merchants were coming there, the Muslim merchants, and they were staying there, they would, of course, have their own mosques. In Guangzhou, there's actually a cemetery that you can still go to with graves of Muslims that are like about 1,200 years old. So these are merchants who passed away in China and they were buried there and the cemetery is still there. Um, and SubhanAllah, we don't know how much longer it will remain there, right? Um, but the, to give you a sense of the level of influence that Islam has, so a person in the Ming Dynasty, so now we're getting into the early 1400s, um, late 1300s, like 1398, there's a person named the Hongwu Emperor. He's the emperor of China, and there's no indication that he's Muslim, but he writes what's called the Hundred Word Eulogy, which is a poem in praise of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is a non-Muslim Chinese emperor, so he's actually the ruler of the country, uh, and he's obviously a poet as well. And you can read an English translation. It's actually very beautiful. You can read the English translation of the Hundred Word Eulogy. Um, but, uh, you know, this gives us a sense of the kind of um, influence that Islam was having culturally even on the non-Muslims of China. Next slide, please. Another um, example of this cultural influence. So, uh, one of the most famous Chinese Muslims, uh, Chinese Muslims in quotations, he was probably of Uyghur origin. So he's one of the, the Simu, what the Mongols would call the Simu, the colored eyes who they moved in from the West into China proper. His name was Hu Si Hui, uh, and he's the uh, author of the oldest um, Chinese cookbook, basically the oldest book of recipes. So his official occupation actually um, was that he was in the royal court, which used to be Khan Balik uh, by the Mongols. It used to be called Khan Balik, today it's called Beijing, right? Um, in the royal court, let's say Beijing to keep it simple, um, he was the chief physician for the royal family. Um, and he writes this cookbook in which he describes basically recipes 
Um, and most of the recipes that he describes are taken from Central Asian, Persian, and Arab cuisine, right? So sheep's heart and some th things that are very quintessentially, um, you know, uh, Arabian foods, very, you know, strongly culturally Arabian foods, um, and even more so from Persia and Central Asia. Some of the ingredients he's trying to describe actually don't even have names in the Chinese language, right? So these foods are all coming in to China from the west, right? China is going eastward. Um, and so one of the foods, for example, is chickpeas. So for chickpeas, there's no name at the time in any of the Chinese languages that they're using. Um, so he uses two words, and the two words that he uses to describe chickpeas translate to Muslim beans, right? So these, he just calls them Muslim beans. There's no word for it, so we might as well, right? Um, and, and many other, you know, he's the first person, so you know how you, in Chinese restaurants, you always see the, um, the duck, right? The, the Peking duck, as it's called, the Beijing duck. So he's the first person to ever describe a recipe, uh, develop a recipe for Peking duck, and then describe its health benefits, right? So many of the things, so you have this Uyghur Muslim person, he's, his name is Hu Si Hui, this is about 700 years ago, he's working in Beijing, uh, the top doctor in the country, basically, and he's writing this cookbook with these um, nutritious as well as uh, tasty kind of recipes for the royal family. Um, and these are the kind of stories that it's, it's so important for us to know, right? To, to be able to say that, you know, Islam in China isn't just something that the Chinese government gets to decide, you know, it's not a fl like a light switch, like turn it on, you know, turn it off, like, okay, time to shut off all the mosques and do this and do that because there's this rich cultural legacy, your own culture that all Chinese people enjoy, not just the Muslims, all Chinese people enjoy. We have contributed to that. We have established that. Next slide, please. And even more so, an example that would be more famous is uh, Zheng He, as it's transcribed, but it's, it's, it's pronounced Cheng Ho, um, who is probably the most famous admiral, the most famous navy leader in Chinese history. So he also worked for the Ming Dynasty, um, and he led these famous seven voyages into the Indian Ocean. And this is before Columbus, this is in the early 1400s. Um, and there's these incredible kind of descriptions, and people turned it into artwork, right? So if you can just get a sense of the fleet here. So he's this Chinese Muslim. He's leading this fleet at the request of the emperor as a diplomat. So he's taking goods, he's going to trade all over the Indian Ocean, and he's going to bring goods back. One of the goods he brought back was a giraffe that no one in China had seen before, right? So he brought back a giraffe, and there was this huge thing in, in Chinese history and manuscripts. You can find like images of the first giraffe that came, and it, because he went all the way to East Africa. Um, and also as a diplomat, so exerting China's uh, soft power, right, the Ming Dynasty's soft power, really putting China on the map, right, when Columbus sailed a few generations later, where was he trying to go? He was trying to reach the east, right, he didn't know about the Americas, he was trying to go all the way around to reach China, to reach India, um, and part of that is because both the um, Indian Muslim rulers, which was the Delhi Sultanate at the time, as well as um, the Chinese, who were of course non-Muslim dynasties but heavily influenced by Islams and there's heavy Muslim involvement in it, both of them um, were, were these thriving places rich in culture and goods and things that the Europeans just really couldn't wait to get their hands on, right? Um, the other thing he did personally, which was not part of his mission, was spread Islam. So in Southeast Asia, much of the work um, to spread Islam was done by this uh, incredibly influential, very powerful Chinese Muslim diplomat, right, Cheng Ho. So if you go to places like Indonesia, Malaysia, you'll often find mosques with the name like Masjid uh, Muhammad Cheng Ho, right, um, especially in Malaysia in Malacca, right, the famous city of Malacca. Um, it's, it was really him that personally, while he was there on the Chinese government missions, he would try to personally use that opportunity to talk to local kings about Islam um, and try to convert them, and a few of them actually did. So this is how the, the real political beginnings of Muslim rule in what is today Malaysia come through this uh, Chinese Muslim admiral. Again, these incredible contributions, just the, the logistics involved in taking this kind of fleet all across the Indian Ocean seven times for the fact, you know, going all the way to Southeast Africa, 
um, is an incredible achievement. Next slide, please. Now coming back to uh, the talking about the Uyghur Muslims a little bit, this is the city of Kashgar, um, you know, incredibly important city in Central Asia um, and uh, uh, one of the centers of culture for the Uyghur people. This is the Eidgah Mosque, which is probably the most famous masjid there. Um, and you can see the, the prayer is happening there, obviously Eidgah, meaning the place of Eid, basically where the Eid prayer is played, uh, prayed and just implying a, a relatively large masjid. I mean, there's so many other uh, photos you can show. And honestly, you know, it's, it's very easy to get these glimpses of Uyghur culture, which is so important for us to, um, you know, recognize and then uh, promote, tell people about it. That these aren't some, you know, and, and part of the problem is, you know, when, when the Notre Dame was burning in France a few years ago, the whole world was on fire with it. Why? Because that building means something to people. There's a particular connection. It's somewhere in their memory banks, that name. As soon as you hear something happened to it, everyone was very worried, right? But with the Uyghurs, that background information is not there. So when you hear the Uyghurs are suffering or they're being oppressed, um, the, the brain isn't really making a very active connection there. It's like, who, who's being oppressed? Like, who are these people? Where are they? Where do they live? What do they look like? What do they do? What's their culture? What's their religion? Like, all of these details are not known, right? Even among Muslims. So if we don't know, and by the time, you know, no one's really going to jump right away and start doing proper research or anything like that. So we have to make ourselves aware of Muslim cultures, and especially Muslim cultures um, of our brothers and sisters who are facing oppression, including the Uyghurs. Um, next slide, please. So Turkestan, or Uyghurstan, like uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, the spread of Islam there is very gradual because of the complicated political situation and because it was obviously quite far from like the centers of Islamic learning, although eventually places like Kashgar itself would become a center of Islamic learning. Um, and it's a crossroads region, like I mentioned earlier, right? You want to control the trade routes, um, and so there's going to be a lot of political upheaval. There are so many people who have ruled that region, occupied it, lost, you know, rebelled, and the Chinese come in, and the Central Asians come in. Um, a lot of activity happening. Um, the first of the Turkic rulers to embrace Islam was uh, Sultan Satuk Bugra Khan. Uh, he embraced Islam in the year 934, and he was the ruler of the Karakhanids, and he actually died in Kashgar. So this is the first time you see like Muslims coming into Kashgar as sort of a um, dominant kind of force. Uh, while the Uyghurs, like I mentioned earlier, are migrating south as well. Over time, you will have uh, many famous scholars come out of Kashgar. Um, the most famous probably is Mahmoud Kashgari, who was famous for his work in uh, Turkic linguistics. Historically, he lived you know many centuries ago. Um, very, very famous, uh, and, or not famous, but interesting example is uh, Sheikha Fatima bin Saad al Khair. Um, so her family was actually from Muslim Spain, right? And this just shows the interconnectedness of the Muslim world at the time. So her family's from Muslim Spain. When, the, when Spain starts to be reconquered by the Christians coming in from the north, her father, who was a scholar himself, Saad al Khair, um, he decides to move with his family to a different part of the Muslim world. And where does he move to? He moves all the way across the map to Kashgar, right? All the way across the map to Kashgar. And that's where Fatima is born. And then she grows up and she's trained there and she becomes a Hadith scholar. Then she gets further training in Persia. And then she gets married to another scholar. And then both of them work uh, for Salahuddin Ayyubi while he's liberating Jerusalem. Right, so these incredible connections of like Kashgar is not some far off place in some corner. It's very much connected to other parts and activities in the Muslim world. Another person uh, to keep in mind, a name to keep in mind is uh, Yusuf Khas Hajib, uh, who was uh, well known for his poetry as well as as a Kalam scholar, a theologian. There are some local beliefs as well that are interesting, some local cultural practices of Islam. Um, you know, there's some locals in Turfan, which is one of the cities in uh, Turkestan, uh, they believe that the cave from Surah Kahaf is uh, in that region and they actually have what's called a mazar or a mausoleum there. People go visit, they climb into the cave and they make dua there and these interesting things happen. Um, and it's a place rich with tradition, right? 
Um, I mean, you know, you can say they need to be re-educated, they're, they're uncultured and this and that, but um, these are people who have a culture just as old as any culture in the world. In fact, Kashgar is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. One of the, like it's been continuously inhabited. It has the oldest uh, market. So the, their Sunday market has been running nonstop for something like 2000 years, right? Uh, same place, same market has just been going on for that long. And so they have the market, you know, they have the garlic belt. So a lot of the um, introduction to different parts of the world through the Silk Road, garlic was sent to different parts of the world, but one of the main centers of production was that Uyghur region. Right, so there you get your garlic sauce, right? Um, you got like uh, famous uh, kind of cultural stories of resistance to Chinese rule, and these goes like, like these go back like centuries. Like this is a tradition. This isn't just a modern political situation. This is something that has been going on for a very long time. And one of uh, there's a story of a woman who resisted uh, sort of Chinese occupation, a Uyghur woman. Her name is Nuzuom. So you can uh, read about her as well. You know, they're, they're famous like salty tea, uh, which is apparently they put salt into the tea and somehow it becomes sweet, right? Or it, it's a very interesting kind of experience. It's, it's similar from what I've heard to Kashmiri pink tea and other kind of regional um, variations. And there's a modern dynamic culture to it as well. So all of these things are very historic, but that doesn't mean they haven't been engaging with the modern world. So one example I came across recently is um, a vaccination campaign, and I thought I'd mention that just because it's relevant. So in the 1890s, uh, the Uyghurs in, in Kashgar, in Uyghurstan, in Turkestan, are having this smallpox vaccination campaign, right? And there's all of these interesting observations about, well, um, are they anti-vaxxers? Like, literally, that's the conversation. It's like, are they anti-vaxxers? And the Chinese official who was in charge of the region at the time, he's reporting that they're not anti-waxers, they just don't trust Chinese officials, right? So if you send them a vaccine with like a Uyghur uh, doctor who's been trained, they will happily take it. They're not against the science itself, they're just against the people kind of pushing the science, right? Um, and there were literally like, in, there was one record in 1884, one of the Uyghur doctors vaccinated a thousand children, right, that year from the smallpox vaccine and basically saved them from that horrific disease. So the point being, this is a place where things are happening from a very long time ago right up to like the present day. It's not some empty land that, you know, you have some economic uh, interests and so you come in and start building and start developing and take the people and do whatever you like with them. No, there's, there's a stand that should be made against that, right? Uh, next slide, please. All right, quickly, um, not to be disrespectful, but we are running out of time. I don't want to be disrespectful to the Koreans. Um, Korea, of course, uh, like I mentioned earlier, also has a very early uh, Muslim history, um, again, through trade. So there's Muslim writers, more than one, who had some very interesting ideas about Al-Shila. So remember in the earlier map, it said Silla was this kingdom which encompassed much of the Korean peninsula uh, in the 700s and the 800s, so Al-Shila, um, the Muslims, uh, for some reason, they chose to describe it like this is like Jannah, basically, right? Like they read some geographical descriptions of just what the mountains are like and the rivers and stuff like that. And they're like, this is like some kind of like piece of, you know, Jannah uh, over here. <laughs> so um, there, there seems to have been this desire to like, we have to visit that place. We have to see that place. Um, so there's a merchant named Suleiman uh, who visited the region in the year 851. He leaves the earliest description in the Arabic language that we have of the Korean Peninsula. Um, and Korean records uh, also indicate that Muslim merchants were definitely there by the 10th century, so the 900s. Um, this I found very, very interesting and I would love to uh, send uh, Kim Jong-un an email, right? And, and just uh, let him know as well. Uh, in the early 11th century, um, a certain Muslim named uh, Minabo, so this is a bunch of um, a, a pair of historians, I shouldn't say in a bunch, right? A pair of historians is writing an article about the history of Muslims in the Korean region. And there's one record that suggests that a person who was Muslim, whose name was Minabo or something like that, became the mayor of Pyongyang, which is modern day Pyongyang, right? Like the same place. 
the capital of present-day North Korea, which does, by the way, have a Muslim community. Like, it's a communist nation, but um, because of the diplomats of Muslim countries who live there, um, there is a mosque in North Korea uh, in Pyongyang. Um, some sources suggest that there was a Muslim community definitely in the Korean Peninsula in, by the 1390s, and this is the description that they have. They wore their own type of clothing and headgear. They maintained their religion unchanged. They built a mosque, and they observed the uh, Muslim festivals. Next slide, please. So the first Korean Muslim is this person by the name of Ramadan. Um, fittingly enough, right? He uh, dies in the year 1349. Um, so he also, there's it's speculated that he may have been a Uyghur origin, and so he was, he's the first recorded Muslim that we know of who was actually Korean, um, or actually was born in Korea, uh, you might say. Um, the Hui Hui Lifa may have been used, I'll uh, describe what that is in a second, may have been used as the basis for the Korean calendar reforms um, that occurred in the early 1400s. And what this was is basically an astronomical chart that was developed again by a Chinese Muslim. The Koreans took it and they used it to develop their own kind of tools for measuring uh, certain things that would help them with developing calendars. So this is something that is located, um, it's called the Celestial Globe. It's located in a Korean museum. So you can see it and it's based on what the uh, Chinese had learned from Arab astronomy, taking that to China, and then from China it was taken to uh, Korea. So Islam dies out in Korea uh, by local wars, uh, sort of in the 1420s, and it's revived uh, only after the Korean War by Turkish soldiers who are fighting, uh, you know, as part of the um, nations fighting in the Korean War, as well as migrants and diplomats, of course. In the modern world, they start to trickle in. Um, South Korea today has a significant Muslim community. Uh, there's one mosque, Rahman Mosque, in North Korea, as I mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Tibet is a very interesting case um, that, again, I would encourage everyone to read more about. Why? Because it, it's the relationship of Islam and Buddhism, right? And usually when we think about da'wah and the um, kind of cultures we have to learn about, we don't think about the Buddhists very much. But there's a very, very long-standing relationship um, of course, Tibet is the land of the Buddhists. That's where the Dalai Lamas come from. Um, and so the Tibetans by the early Muslims are considered to be related to the Turks. So the Muslims assume that they're one of the Turkic peoples. Of course, they are close and there's some relationship. Um, and they describe the place, one of the things, the curiosities that the, the Muslim writers pick up very early on, and this is over a thousand years ago, is it's said that when you get to Tibet, you start laughing hysterically or you're smiling like, like crazy, right? Um, and it's, it's fascinating that that's something that they observed but had no explanation for. In modern times, we know that Tibet is like literally right beside Mount Everest, right? It's the highest plateau in the world. Right, in terms of it's uh, you know, above sea level, how far above sea level it is. Um, and so, Oh, you know, that means that there's a certain kind of nutrients that you're going to be lacking when you're that high up. And that is going to, you know, and this was later observed in places like Kashmir and other places in Nepal, in the Himalayas as well, that people have certain different characteristics because of the very high altitude that they live in and what that does to their brain. So that was kind of the connection that was made centuries later. Um, it was known among the Muslims for its prized musk, which was praised by uh, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, among others. And the musk was used uh, in perfumery, in medicine, in poetry as well. So these constant references to musk, right? And there's even a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam basically encouraging the use of musk. Um, although I'm not aware of the authenticity, so please get that double checked. Um, records suggest that a mosque and a small Muslim community existed in Lhasa, which is the capital of Tibet, uh, in the 900s. And there's so many stories with the fifth Dalai Lama, especially, um, of Muslims' engagement. So there's stories like, you know, he saw Muslims praying in the distance and he invited them and asked them, what are you doing? And they explained uh, their religion to him. And then he gave them land because he was also the political ruler of Tibet. He gave them land in Lhasa to build um, a mosque for themselves. Of course, these stories may have been made up later on. They're not, it's difficult to confirm them next to impossible. 
Um, but there were uh, more firm uh, relations as well. For example, Kashmiri Muslims uh, trading in Tibet, right, during uh, the time of the Dalai Lama. And also he helped Afa Khwaja, who is one of the Central Asian rulers, um, in Turkestan, again, so this is the close relationship between the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, um, he helped him gain power in Kashgar. So everyone's involved in the local politics and everyone's also involved in the local exchange of cultures. Brother, next slide, please. Um, so Japan is our last stop, so we're almost done. Um, Islam comes to Japan very late, as far as we know, compared to the rest of the region. Japan has always been um, enjoyed as sort of isolation, as cultural isolation, right? Um, of course, not completely isolated. That would be nearly impossible. But, um, you know, relatively speaking, um, they traded with who they had to trade with, but they didn't go too far afield until modern times, right? Um, until modern times, Japan begins to emerge as a a important regional power. So I'm just gonna explain these two images um, before we get into like some of those details. The first one is basically from um, uh, World War II, right? And it's, it's uh, a Tatar girls school in Tokyo. So Tatar Muslims, uh, people like, you know, um, uh, from who are sort of Russian Muslims who have escaped from Russia and they have sought refuge in Japan and they are, what the, the caption says is they're actually praying for the death of Bolshevism, of communism, right? And this is in the context of World War II. So this is almost like a, uh, <laughs> like a PR kind of thing happening here. Um, but this is, of course, at the same time, a picture of the early Muslim community uh, in Japan, some of the children. Um, Omar Yamaoka earlier, uh, in the early years of the 1900s, I believe 1903 or something like that, he became the first Japanese person to uh, perform Hajj. So he was sent as a diplomat to the Middle East, um, and on the way he learned about Islam, and by the, what, and by the time he got to the Middle East, he had actually embraced Islam. Um, and then he was treated very, you know, as a special person, taken inside the Kaaba. He was allowed to pray inside the Kaaba and, and many different things. And then he did, of course, uh, perform his diplomatic uh, functions as well. Next slide, please. So there you have some names of how Muslims, you know, again, because there wasn't a lot of contact or interaction, they were using different names, you know, Yaban, Chapun, Kaponya. They would kind of play around with what they heard about this place very far off and there's a silence, right, on early Muslim Japanese engagement, which does which mean it doesn't mean it never happened, but it might have never happened, right? It's maybe we'll find evidence that suggests otherwise someday. Um, the first major discussion of Islam in a Japanese work of writing is in the year seventeen fifteen. Uh, in the 1870s, so as we get to modern times and Japan starts to open up a bit to the world, um, a Sira work, a uh, basically a Sira biography of the Prophet Wasallam is translated into Japanese for the first time. And in 1920, um, the Quran is translated into Japanese for the first time uh, by a Buddhist scholar. After there's a sudden influx, like, you know, during that time in the 1910s, like 600 Muslims suddenly came because of Japan's international relations and they came as refugees and they settled in Japan. So there was this sudden surge of interest in what is this religion, what do these people believe? Um, the Japanese, uh, the other way, um, the Japanese embassy to Qajar Iran, uh, the Qajar ruled Iran, uh, as well as Ottoman Turkey in 1880 was the beginning of diplomatic ties with the Muslims and a trickle of immigration uh, begins. So you have some Egyptians, especially, in the late uh, 1890s and early years of the 1900s, some Egyptians and some Indians who kind of trickle uh, into Japan and start, and many of them marry locally and start these uh, sort of mixed families. Um, but it's important to realize that when the early decades of the 1900s came, about 100 years ago, there were only two countries left in the world that were not uh, directly colonized by the European powers. One of them was Japan, the other one was Ottoman Turkey, right? So these two powers kind of recognize that, that we, we're the only ones left, right, who haven't been directly colonized. And so that too spurred like sort of some collaboration uh, between them. Mosques were established uh, in Japan in the cities, as you can see there. The first one is 1905, which was established by Russian prisoners of war. So Russian Muslims who were imprisoned 
in Japan were allowed to establish this mosque in 1905. Um, and this 1905 is very interesting because that's the year that Japan was really put on the map uh, among the Muslims. And the reason for that um, is the Russo-Japanese War. So the Russians and the Japanese went to war in 1905 and the most unexpected thing, something that no one would have ever, ever like bet their money on or expected was that Japan would win the war. So Russia was this huge superpower, right? The Russian Empire, Tsarist Russia, and Russia was obviously dominating the Muslims in Central Asia. All of the stands were occupied by Russia. So for the Muslims, Russia was this, um, you know, behemoth occupying power. And when they see this tiny country, Japan, defeat the Russians in a war, like, the conversation about Japan suddenly changes to, to the point that, you know, there's all of these articles being written in Persian magazines that, oh, the Japanese emperor is probably an Arab, right? He's probably descended from the Arabs. Like, only an Arab could have done this, right? No one else could have led the Japanese to victory over the Russians. Um, and, and many other kinds of theories like that. People are writing all kinds of interesting articles. Um, people are like, oh, he's secretly converted to Islam, even though he's not publicly Muslim, but he's secretly Muslim. Like, we're trying to claim the guy. Like, how could you defeat the Russians, right? Um, and so 1905 really becomes this year, and 1906, of course, trickling forward, that Muslims all over the world hear about Japan, like, properly for the first time. What is this place? Who are these people? What do they believe? What do they do? Kind of thing. Um, and another person who puts a lot of effort in that direction, I won't go too much into detail, was a person named uh, Imam Abdul Rashid Ibrahim. Uh, he was also a Tatar Muslim, so, you know, Japan becomes this refuge for Muslims who are coming from Russia, they're fleeing uh, political persecution in Russia. So um, he is one of the most active of them. He's a Tatar Imam, uh, and he kind of flees Russia as well, um, you know, for his own safety as well as for his family's safety, uh, eventually, because he's preaching against the Russian government and makes it to Tokyo, where the Japanese government works very closely with him. Um, and, and, you know, there's an interesting story about he's meeting all of these Japanese officials and they ask him, um, what do, does your religion say anything about us? Like, do, you know, do you guys know anything about us? Like the Japanese, right? That's what he's asking, or they're asking him. And he pulled, he got a tissue paper, which was apparently the only paper available, and he wrote the Hadith, seek knowledge, even if you have to go as far as China, right? He writes the Hadith on a piece of paper in Arabic. He's a trained Imam, so he knows that. So he writes the Hadith, right? Quote, unquote, Hadith, like I mentioned at the beginning, is the authenticity is debated, right? But anyways, he chooses to write that. And the, uh, the, the description is, is so fascinating about how amazed they were, right? Even though it didn't even say Japan, it just, it just said China. But the way he explained it to them is like, oh, it means China and like the surrounding, every, like the whole region, right? And so there was all this excitement among the Japanese that there's something in their religion about us, right? Obviously not understanding the context of it. Next slide, please. And, and finally, I want to bring it local. So I apologize for going over time, but I want to conclude with this. Um, we, we learned about the history of different, um, you know, Muslim engagement uh, Muslim presence in different parts of the world with different cultures and all of these kinds of things. Um, and it should naturally lead us as people who live in places that are so diverse, that are so multicultural, to think about, okay, what is our relationship now with different communities, right? I've just, I've been staying in New York City. I'm from Toronto. Like the places we live in are, you know, you can meet and you can engage with people from all over the world, from different cultures, right? Um, and so one story I want to share that hopefully, uh, you know, you may find inspiring is um, uh, Yuri Kochiyama and Malcolm X, as you may have recognized, and the famous Harlem Towers from, uh, from New York City in the background, right? Um, so Yuri Kochiyama was a survivor of the Japanese internment camps when the Americans interned the Japanese in World War II for being enemy aliens. And Malcolm X, I don't need to tell you his story, I'm sure you guys all know, but she was much younger than him, and she was very inspired by his, his speeches, his politics, right? Um, and Malcolm was very close to his family. He knew uh, her parents, and she was a student of his, right? And so when Malcolm, you know, this is from his journey, when he went for the Hajj, you can see it's from Kuwait, 
during that journey when he was in Kuwait he sends the family a postcard to Harlem they also live in Harlem and he called he used to call them the best family in Harlem right he used to like have this very uh, close relationship with this uh, Japanese family um, because of their shared experiences of oppression in America um, and so when there's a famous picture, by the way, when Malcolm was assassinated, she was actually there. And there's this famous picture and people often wonder, like, who is who's the Japanese woman? She's right. Like she's holding his dead body right as he is because she, she was sitting in the front row. And when he was shot, she kind of jumped on the stage. Right. Um, and she's holding his dead body. And later on, she uh, converted to Islam for a brief time. So she converted to Sunni Islam um, and her family didn't. And for, there's many different stories about why she eventually left Islam, but for many years um, in the 1970s, she was a Muslim, she was living in Harlem, um, and she was an activist for the black uh, Muslims, for the, the Muslim community. You know, even when Malcolm X came back and he started his school where he used to teach about Islam proper, she was one of the students, right? And she used to learn about Islam from him after he came back from the Hajj. Um, and then he passed away, and then she embraced Islam. But even though she eventually left Islam, um, or Allah knows best, whether she really did or not, we don't know, uh, she continued to be this incredible ally, like a true ally to the black Muslims, to the point that um, in the 1980s, when Muslims in New York would get arrested, they all had her phone number memorized. So when the police or anyone gave them the opportunity and said, who do you want to call, before calling their lawyers or even their families, they would call her because they knew that she was the person who was going to be more energetic than anyone to organize, like whatever, if it was a protest or a lawyer or whatever needed to happen, uh, she had to do it. And much into her old age, when 9-11 happened, she was, she was already an elderly woman by then, but still remained very, very active in the anti-war protests, it, you know, opposing the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. cetera. Um, and she passed away just a few years ago, right? So these are like the kind of local stories that should remind us what kind of local relationships do we build um, when we want to share our culture, our way of life with other people, what do we do to make sure that they also feel comfortable, that we also express a curiosity, a genuine curiosity to say, what's your culture? Tell me about your culture. Let's talk about our shared history. It doesn't matter, you're from Japan, you're from Russia, you're from West Africa. It doesn't matter where you're from. We can talk about the shared history that my people, Muslims and your people have had in this land and we can talk about it locally as well. And that's how you start making those connections with genuine people that are not only going to be good for our communities but inshallah will also uh, really bring new life to the da'wah that we do as we try to spread the message of Islam. So I want to conclude with that. Uh, Jazakallah khair for listening. I apologize for going over time. Um, and uh, I'm not sure, do we still have time for Q&A? A few minutes? Yeah, so if anyone does have uh, any burning questions, I'm kind of tired too, to be honest, because I've been running all over New York City and, and checking it out, and it's the biggest city I've ever been to. Uh, very cool place, right? Um, I'm sure you guys know a lot more that makes it less cool, but I've only seen the cool stuff, alhamdulillah. Um, but if anyone does have any, like, you know, questions, uh, please, please go ahead. Yes, sir. I may not be able to hear you from all the way back there. I appreciate it. Jazakallah khair. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, paper and also gunpowder, right? Two things that were invented in China that nobody made use of like the Muslims, at least at the beginning, right? Could the Ottomans have conquered Constantinople without gunpowder? They probably could not have, right? Or the city that we know as Istanbul today, right? And, and paper even more so, like all of the cultural, when we read about Ibn Sina and all of the great scientists and all the great thinkers and all the different fields and the spread of knowledge um, like no other civilization had done before. Paper was first produced in China and picked up by the Muslims when they conquered Central Asia and brought back and then the paper mill started in Baghdad and Cairo and Dimashq and other places um, in Muslim Spain and Andalusia, right? And that's where the Europeans first picked up on paper. But it was 
Um, those, those two inventions in particular, and many other things, Chinese medicine, that the Arabs contributed, the Muslims contributed to Chinese medicine, and they also learned a lot from the Chinese and the knowledge exchange that had happened. So I really didn't focus on that, but that's an excellent point. We should also focus on uh, the exchange of knowledge, right, while we're talking about ideas and people and goods moving around. Um, and Indonesia, of course, very rich history of the spread of Islam there, so I won't go into that. The Chinese did play a role in that. Right, and vice versa, the Indonesians. So, so there's a lot, a lot of movement. And the Indian Ocean, historically, even by historians, uh, it's called the Muslim Lake, right? Because on all sides of it, it was surrounded by basically Muslim majority societies. So there was a Muslim dominance in that uh, region in the maritime trade, which has been essential to the spread of Islam as well. So um, keep all of that in mind. Of course, this was just scratching the surface, to be honest. Jazakallah khair. Any, uh, Anything else? All right. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. So to what the brother is saying is that um, what we might refer to as the Chinese Muslims or even the Hui as Chinese Muslims is really an identity that develops during the Ming period and afterwards, which, which is to say sort of in starting in the 1400s, 1500s and later on. So the first, you could say 700s or uh, 700 years or so of Muslim history in China, um, they have Turkic Muslims. Of course, we have merchants as well, like Persian and Arab merchants who are kind of moving around the area, but mostly Turkic Muslims who are moving around as merchants, as mercenaries in other roles um, who are present in what is today the Chinese mainland. Um, and of course, we describe what we think of as China proper historically, right? It's not modern day China. Modern day China is occupying uh, Turkestan as well as Tibet. Right, so that's not part of like historic China. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I've heard uh, theories, to be honest, but I haven't looked into it in enough detail to kind of to see whether it's confirmed or, or denied, right? Um, I think it's, mo it's more important to be open to the possibility, right? So when we do a presentation like this, it's like let's open up the conversation a little bit for questions like the one you just asked. Now we can go into more specifics of like, okay, was there a conversion to Islam in that sense? And many, many other questions that we could address as well. So to that question, I don't have an answer. I need to learn more as well, but it's an important question. And hopefully everyone who sat in, in the presentation does have more questions, like a lot of questions that I didn't answer, because that's the whole point, that we need to learn more, that there's so much more that we can dig up and discuss on this topic. So Jazakallah khair, brother. And uh, we'll wrap it up there because I think it's Isha time. So Jazakallah khair, everyone for sticking around and uh, listening. And um, I'm, I'm still here, inshallah, for a little bit um, if you have uh, anything else you want to talk about. But I really appreciate the opportunity. Asalaamu Alaikum. <laughs>